Military Personnel Subcommittee will come to order. I want to welcome everyone to our subcommittee hearing on service member talent management and the effects of legacy personnel policies on military members and their families. From the service personnel chiefs, talent management, officer or enlisted, is at the core of almost all military personnel policy, from promotions to change of station to child care and spouse employment. And how these policies affect these issues, the service member and their family, for their entire career. It is the center of everything you do. Today, I want to explore a wide range of policies, especially how your talent management programs have considered not just the service member, but their family, and how career progression decisions are impacted by these policies. Service members and military families have personal needs, and when the military services fail to consider those needs as part of assignments and moves, we pay for it with lower morale, lower retention, and even suicides. It goes without saying that the high cost of recruiting, training, and developing replacements, and some personnel with critical skills, are very hard to replace. Service culture has driven career management for too long to the detriment of talent retention and diversity, whether racial, gender, or geographic in many cases. Congress has given you extensive statutory flexibilities to manage personnel through the NDAA over the last several years. We want to hear what you have done to implement these authorities to change the longstanding service cultural barriers and box checking requirements for career management. We hear a lot of lip service about recruiting the service member but retaining the family. I believe we have and still are leaving the family behind. The total person who importantly includes the family needs to be considered in development and execution of all these policies, not as an afterthought. Many policies continue to be industrial age remnants, including moving from place to place at a cost of about $8 billion a year which may be part of the career development or necessary for rotation from overseas, but it is a prime legacy policy that contributes to a military spouse unemployment rate that is 24%, according to the GAO. PCS moves are incredibly disruptive and have received little attention until now. For example, now that remote meetings and learning are commonplace, why are we requiring families to move or separating families for six months or a year for professional military education. Have the services considered changes as it relates to longer times in the same place for those that may benefit from or even prefer some stability for themselves or their families, even if that comes with a perceived career setback? The Marine Corps 2030 Talent Management Plan specifically proposes lengthening the time between moves to reduce disruption for military families. This disruption in particular leads to financial hardship, loss of jobs for spouses, scrambling for or a lack of childcare availability, instability for school-aged children, and especially so for children in the exceptional family member program for whom parents must fight school districts after every move to obtain appropriate educational services for their child with special needs, and an incredible cost to the services. Is it really worth it in its current form? Lack of racial, geographic, and talent diversity have been longstanding problems in the services, especially in the officer corps, and especially in fields like aviation and combat arms that lead to higher commands. We want to learn what has been done with regard to actual personnel policy changes to address lack of diversity. We also want to know how these real needs and challenges of service members, their families, and the service requirements themselves can be dealt with in a system rooted and largely stuck in the past that cannot keep up with the speed of societal or technological change. All of the services operate personnel commands, but do these organizations have meaningful ways to accept input from and meet the preferences of service members, both officers and enlisted, or are they really just putting faces in spaces without regard to the real impact on people and families? Okay, before hearing from our briefers, let me offer Ranking Member Gallagher an opportunity to make opening remarks. Thank you, Chairwoman Speer. I want to thank all our witnesses for being here today. Uh, talent management in the services is 
an extraordinarily important topic uh, for this committee, uh, for the broader committee. In fact, I can't think of a more important topic. You know, a lot of times on this committee, we tend to focus on the fancy hardware, uh, the ships, the, the planes, the guns, the bombs, but at the end of the day, it all comes down to people. It's whether we can recruit and retain talented, smart, highly ethical people to defend this country. And so thank you for your, your uh, service and, and your commitment to solving that very uh, difficult problem. And I think as we think about the threats we face from China, Russia emerging, uh, or you know, Iran or other emerging threats, the constant in all of this is that we need to have warriors in our military with the moral conviction, the physical constitution, and the character to defeat our adversaries. And I look at talent management as critical to success in the multi-domain battle space. We need uh, the people with the right skills, knowledge, the abilities, uh, the ability to embrace the warrior ethos. And as service personnel chiefs, you and your staffs play an integral component in the success of our military. So for me personally, one of the interest areas uh, in today's hearing is understanding your service definition of talent management, how that is woven into the fabric of your organization, how you think about investing in the right people, which I think may be the single most important factor in any organization's success. Um, through the strength of the joint force, in my opinion, ultimately relies upon the strength of our broader society, and talent management should target the best and the brightest to serve our nation, regardless of socioeconomic status, race, color, or creed. Um, how do we reach that person that has not yet been exposed to the military but has the talent uh, to serve? In my own case, not coming from a military family, it almost happened by happenstance based on something I started studying uh, in college. I think another integral component of talent management is promotion and retention. Uh, I believe our military is and should be a meritocracy. We should promote individuals that are most deserving and exemplify the warrior ethos. However, my concern is ensuring DOD has the tools needed to, pro to proactively uh, retain and promote the talent required to defeat our adversaries, as well as sort of the niche specialized talents we are going to need to win a long-term competition with China, whether that is a greater cadre of Mandarin linguists or people that have facility in, in certain technological areas like quantum or AI. So there's a lot to dig into today. Very much looking forward to it. And uh, with that, I yield back to the chairwoman. I thank the ranking member. I ask unanimous consent to include in the record all member statements and extraneous material. Without objection, so ordered. I would now like to welcome our distinguished witnesses, Lieutenant General Gary Brito, Deputy Chief of Staff, G1 for the U.S. Army, Vice Admiral John Noel, Jr., Chief of Navy Personnel, Lieutenant General Brian Kelly, Deputy Chief of Staff for Manpower, Personnel, and Services, U.S. Air Force, Lieutenant General David Ockenon, Deputy Com Commandant, Manpower and Reserve Affairs, U.S. Marine Corps. And Ms. Patricia Mulcahy, SES, Deputy Chief of Space Operations for Personnel at the U.S. Space Force. Each member will have an opportunity to question the briefers for five minutes following their statements. And with that, let's begin with Luch Lieutenant General Brito. You may begin. Good afternoon, Ch Chairwoman Speer, Ranking Member Gallagher, distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to be appear before you on behalf of the men and women of the United States Army. The Army's number one priority remains our people, soldiers, Army civilians, families, and veterans. All of our Army's personnel programs and initiatives are focused on taking care of our people with dignity and respect and building a culture of trust and cohesion. We continue to focus on the Army People Strategy's mission and vision to acquire, develop, employ, and retain the very best talent, uniform and civilian alike. One of the critical enablers from the Army People Strategy is our, our Army's 21st century talent management system, which we are continuing to build and refine today. Today, I would like to give you an update on Army's talent management initiatives. Personnel readiness is critical to Army readiness. New technology, programs, policy, innovation, and management models are transforming, transforming the Army's personnel systems and will provide our soldiers and civilians with more opportunities to excel and improve our ability to compete for and retain talent. The Integrated Personnel and Pace System Army, also known as IPSA, is the number one human resource modernization effort for the total Army. 
IPSE is the Army's new web-based HR system, which, when fully deployed, will, develop, will deliver a single comprehensive data-rich HR and talent management system to the total force. The Army Talent Attribute uh, Framework, or ATAF, and the Army Talent Alignment Process collectively is a decentralized, regulated, market-style hiring system that aligns officers and non-commissioned officers in some cases with jobs based on their preferences and the talents needed by commanders in the field for specific jobs. This talent marketplace gives leaders more flexibility to build a team of individuals with the needed skills, talent, and experience they need. It also gives individuals more control over their assignments and their career path. A similar process called the Assignment Satisfaction Key Enlisted Model, ASCIM, and other processes are in place for our senior non-commissioned officers. The Command Assessment Program continues to improve the Army's ability to select leaders at the battalion and brigade levels who are more cognitively capable, better communicators, both oral and written, more physically fit, more self-aware, and less likely to exhibit counterproductive or ineffective leadership traits. Initiatives such as direct commissions, brevet promotion, and the options for individual service members to have more control over when they are considered for promotion continue to help the Army fill critical shortages in technical fields and also gives individuals more flexibility on their career paths. Talent Race Branching for Army ROTC and the United States Military Academy combines talent assessments, coaching, resumes, interviews, and selection panels to put these new officers in the right branch at the start of their careers. The Army also continues to build initiatives to acquire and retain civilian talent. The use of direct hiring authority for students and recent graduates allows the Army to expeditionally compete for new talent entering the workforce. And also, the Army has established the Army Career Civilian Management Activity, the first ever organization specifically designated to provide centralized career management services for our treasured Army civilians. Lastly, we recognize that talent management is more than just acquiring, developing, and distribution. We fully recognize the connection to our Army families. The Army will keep a keen eye on the impacts of PCS moves, quality of life efforts, employment opportunities, and more as the Army maintains its combat readiness. Chairwoman Spear, Ranking Member Gallagher, members of this committee, I thank you for your generous and unwavering support of our outstanding soldiers, civilian professionals, and their families. Thank you. Thank you, General. Admiral Noel. Chairwoman Spear, Ranking Member Gallagher, and distinguished subcommittee members, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Navy's military personnel talent management modernization initiatives. The service and sacrifice of our sailors and their families amidst the challenges of a global pandemic has enabled our Navy to project power around the globe and accomplish our worldwide missions. We are leveraging our asymmetric advantage, our people. As part of Sailor 2025, we continue to modernize talent management programs, training systems, and recruiting platforms. We're transforming internal business processes to improve HR service delivery to our sailors, increase agility, accelerate responsiveness, and reduce cost. Thanks to the continued support of Congress in fully funding our My Navy HR transformation programs, our efforts have allowed us to simplify and streamline personnel and pay services for sailors across the fleet. We continue to leverage our large-scale digital recruiting presence through our Forged by the Sea marketing and advertising strategy, which allows us to reach all zip codes to access previously undiscovered talent. In 2017, 34% of our marketing and advertising was digital. Today, nearly 100%. We realize that PCS moves and job changes continue to factor significantly in sailor and family retention decisions. In response, over the past five years, the Navy has focused on improving geographic stability, and currently more than 75,000 sailors have been at the same duty location for at least three years with over 42,000 of those sailors and their families stable for four or more years. We also announced recently our new detailing marketplace assignment policy, which will provide additional opportunities for improving geographic stability for sailors electing to stay at sea 
beginning next month. Continuous learning also remains a key warfighting enabler, and Navy is committed to investing in education for our current and future leaders. This past year, the United States Naval Community College successfully complete, completed its first pilot course offerings with nearly 600 students across the sea services completing courses across operationally relevant co uh, concentration areas. And we thank Congress for the degree granting authority that was included in FY22 NDAA. Additionally, we continue to develop our talent through Ready Relevant Learning, a career-long learning continuum transforming an industrial age training model into a modern responsive system. Our Navy remains committed to attracting, developing, and inspiring America's finest talent so that we can best protect and defend our American way of life. We appreciate all of your support, and as CNO discussed last month, though, every day matters in this critical decade, and a year-long continuing resolution will degrade our warfighting capability and would have significant impacts on fulfilling our commitments to our sailors and families. Like you, I remain inspired by our sailors each and every day. They exceed every expectation. You can remain proud of them for what they're doing around the globe. We so appreciate your support and commitment to the men and women of the United States Navy and their families. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Admiral. Lieutenant General Kelly. Chairwoman Speer, Ranking Member Gallagher, distinguished members of this subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you to talk about our airmen and families. I'm honored to appear before you today with my fellow service personnel chiefs, and I'm particularly proud to be here with my Department of the Air Force partner, Ms. Mulcahy, who's here representing the U.S. Space Force. The U.S. Space Force was purposely built as an agile and operationally focused service with the United States Air Force providing much of the support programs for guardians and their families. As such, some of the support programs we will discuss today are applicable to both airmen and guardians. As the Air Force Chief of Staff has articulated, our national security challenges are growing at a rapid pace. It is clear our Air Force must accelerate the changes we need to successfully meet those challenges or face losing. We are fully focused on this imperative and recognize that airmen and their families form the essential foundation for our ability to meet those future challenges anytime, anywhere. As such, it's essential we accelerate the establishment of the environment, the developmental paths, and the talent management systems needed to unlock our airmen's ability to reach their full potential. We know success squarely depends on our airmen and on them having the ability to operate in a safe and inclusive environment where they can be the best airmen they can be, possibly be. Your United States Air Force is an all-volunteer force, and in order to maintain and be an employer of choice, it is important that current and prospective members see the Air Force as an agile employer, flexible in meeting the personal needs of its members and families while also meeting our operational requirements. It is critical we challenge existing paradigms and remain open-minded about the way we attract and retain top talent in our military and civilian ranks. We must inject flexibility into career paths and focus on efforts on capitalizing on diversity within the total force while testing unconventional ways to ensure the Air Force is a career choice our airmen are excited to pursue. While the Air Force is an all-volunteer force, we are also a worldwide requirements-based force, and we must meet our commitments to deliver airmen and capabilities to combatant commanders in locations all across the globe. The Air Force is working hard to balance the needs of the service while accommodating service member requests that often include the desire for increased family stability, something we aim to provide when we are able to do so without sacrificing our ability to meet wartime requirements. We recognize military service impacts the whole family, not just the service members, and have adjusted policies to provide longer tour lengths, as well as earlier notifications and simplified processes for permanent change of station moves. Additionally, the Department of the Air Force continues to work with states and military communities as part of our strategic basing process to factor in the community's ability to provide adequate education and to advance the ability for spouses to sustain careers without added expense or delays. This key program signals the seriousness of our commitment to these programs directly to our community partners. Since taking care of airmen and families is a mission imperative for us, I also want to mention the challenges and impacts we face if we continue to operate under or end up in operating under a year-long continuing resolution. A year-long CR essentially equates to a $5.5 billion top-line reduction in buying power. Within our personnel budgets, we are very appreciative of the pay raise for FY22 for both military and civilian members and believe it was absolutely necessary. But covering those bills under a reduced mill purse top-line further erodes our ability to cover other costs. This means the department will have to eliminate incentives and bonuses impacting approximately 11,000 military members, as well as to reduce the number of accessions late in the fiscal year fourth quarter, maybe by up to 21,000 members. Further, the department will have to delay or cancel necessary PCS moves, creating uncertainty for many families, particularly during the summer months, when the majority of our moves occur in order to accommodate school schedules. 
This in turn impacts spousal employment, child care, and school transition plans both in the U.S. and overseas. A year-long CR also impacts our authorized MILCON efforts supporting child care and our ability to execute civilian hiring actions, including hard-fought gains we are making to increase our resiliency and directed prevention workforce programs. As a bottom line, we should all understand that a year-long CR will have a negative impact to our airmen and families. In conclusion, resilient airmen and families are our competitive advantage, and they deserve nothing less than our best. The United States Air Force is committed in our actions to support our airmen and families, and we look forward to continuing to partner with the Congress in our endeavors to do so. I appreciate your continued support of your Air Force, your airmen, both military and civilian, and the families who support them. I thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General Kelly. Lieutenant General Akinan. Did I pronounce that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. General, is your microphone on? Sorry, there you go. My apologies, Chairwoman. We have decisively stepped down on talent management design and modernization efforts to increase the readiness and the lethality of your Marine Corps to fight and win if called upon by our nation. The Commandant published Force Design 2030, and it's all about lethality and warfighting capabilities. Talent Management 2030 supports these efforts. Accomplishing these objectives of force design will not be possible without highly skilled, mature, and mentally tough Marines to execute it. Talent management is all about building that future force that is better equipped to fight and win in an increasingly high-tech and complex environment. There are three main points I would leave with you this afternoon. First is that we recognize that we're in a competition for talent and we are executing our initiatives at speed today. The statutory authorities that Congress has granted have streamlined this effort. Other initiatives will require more study to implement. We remain committed to getting this right. Second, this is a multi-year effort that will require time and resources to complete successfully. A fundamental redesign of our personnel system is necessary to provide management talent and includes upgrading decade-old decade old systems to the digital cloud-based technologies of today. Predictable funding will be a key to our success. Finally, your Marines and your Marine Corps has always been about families and when people is our business. Our focus remains on building and managing and interfacing with the best of our nation's men and women that serve and defend this country. And we also want to ensure the readiness of their families. We know that we recruit the Marine, but we retain the family. I'm proud to represent your Marines, their families, and the civilian employees, and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, General. Ms. Mulcahy. Thank you, Chairwoman Spear, Ranking Member Gallagher, distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for your leadership and support that you have provided to the United States Space Force, our guardians, and their families. It's a privilege to come before you today alongside my military colleagues. And as we purposefully build a force capable of securing the space domain, we developed and released our new human capital vision, the Guardian Ideal, back in September of last year. Our approach is grounded in our values of connection, commitment, competency, and courage, and combines the more traditional recruit and retain objectives with an eye towards connecting with our guardians and their families, enabling a digital force while integrating wellness and resiliency. Because of our small size and the importance of establishing our warfighting culture, we believe it vital to be collaborative and connected to all of our guardians, both uniformed and civilian, in a way that would be much more difficult in a larger service. This innovative human capital and talent management design we are creating is team-centric, capable of scaling on demand and adapting to changing circumstances. And it is designed to allow our guardians to move more easily between full and part-time statuses. This approach could allow us to flex with our force so our members do not have to choose between their careers and their personal lives. And to implement our vision, we have three guiding principles. 
manage talent based on competencies required to succeed, find and develop diverse talent to advance our mission, and provide access to the digital services, tools, and training. We have developed occupational competencies for all five of our warfighting space capabilities of operation, intelligence, cyber, acquisition, and engineering. We are conducting barrier analysis with various diverse groups to listen to how our guardian experiences could be more inclusive. And using a boot camp approach to training coders, resulting in increased digital fluency and positive impacts to mission accomplishment. Over the past two years, we secured a number of wins for our nation. I am proud of the more than 13,000 military and civilian guardians who joined our ranks from the Air Force, Army, Navy, and Marine Corps, as well as from across America. We launched recruiting initiatives to ensure we are competitive for the STEM talent we need. We instituted interviews that include scientifically based questions to help us determine how the applicant aligns with the Space Force values to create that holistic approach to selecting our future guardians, create a more diverse applicant pool, and ensure a best fit. We are moving from an annual evaluation-based performance appraisal system to one that is more continuous approach and captures the inputs of subordinates, peers, and superiors to provide a more comprehensive and timely picture of guardian performance, potential, and growth. And let me also state that there are real impact resource impacts to our guardians and their families and our mission if we do not receive an FY22 appropriation. The long-term vision for consolidation of all Armed Forces Space Force professionals, it will be stalled. We would be unable to execute Army and Navy inter-service unit transfers and unable to cover much needed increases in our civilian talent. And finally, there will be delays in building our proactive, preventative, integrated resiliency program. And although I'm very pleased with the progress that's been made, we have much work to do in this third year of building the Space Force. We want to deliver capability that includes in integrating our reserve components and our sister services to create that more permanent and agile force. We will continue to focus on our innovative approach to talent management, allowing us to build an organizational culture in which leaders at every level take bold, data-driven, and risk-informed actions. We will capitalize on the diverse ability of our nation's guardians to secure American interests in space and make the contributions to joint operations. I thank you for your time today and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I will... Um now ask a, a series of questions in my five minutes. Uh, General Brito, there were twice as many service members who died from suicide in Alaska in 2021 as from the year before. Um, it's a difficult area, cold weather. Um, we have heard that um, in many of these settings, these are uh, first time deployed enlisted soldiers many who have come from warmer climes and unaccustomed to the, uh, the cruelty of the weather in Alaska. So I'm, I'm curious whether or not you have um, used a volunteer program to enlist soldiers to go to Alaska. And for those that like it in Alaska, um, there is an interest, I think, for many of them to want to remain. So what are you doing about that? Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Spears. We are running a long-term pilot, enlistment option 90 with the official term, to uh, share with soldiers when they enlist for who, those who want to enlist in Alaska, either ones who live in Alaska, Wisconsin, or other cold climates, and they want to serve in that area. Uh, to date, we have 600 so future soldiers, I'll call them enlistees, enrolled in that program. I say future soldiers and enlistees, some are in the, in the basic training pipeline now, <coughs> but will soon move on to an assignment in Alaska, and some are in assignments to Alaska as well. We do hope that we'll culturally and environmentally uh, uh, further mitigate any environmental concerns uh, that may cause a soldier to die from suicide. Fully, fully share the same concerns with you as well. Additionally, looking at re-enlistment options for those who want to stay in Alaska after their first term assignment, second term assignment, or some professional growth as well, and of course, that will be balanced uh, with the needs of the Army and needs of the readiness, professional military education, and of course, career progression growth. I would like to highlight an ongoing visit as we speak in Alaska now, led by our Vice Chief Staff of the Army, 
our Sergeant Major of the Army, representation from the chapel, chaplain, uh, Surgeon General, and a quality of life staff as well to look at the entirety of the environment and, and holistically for all that can support Alaska, all the camps, posts, and stations included, and they will come back and share that information with us. And we have later in the spring a precision focused visit, which I may be on myself, a focus on suicide specifically for Alaska, fully understanding that some of the conditions there are more severe than others. Share your concern, ma'am, and we are getting at it aggressively. The subcommittee will hold a, a town hall later this month with our service members in Alaska, and um, we intend to also send a team up as well. So I, I thank you for that, but I continue to be very concerned about it. In talking to some of the healthcare professionals who work in Alaska, in the Fairbanks area, um, their concern is, is that many of these new enlisted soldiers who are being deployed for the first time either have mental health issues, were seen for mental health issues, or have substance abuse issues that um, probably should have screened them out of going to Alaska. And I hope that you will look at that as well um, in the coming months. We would like a report back on uh, those who are part of this pilot program to see how many do in the end uh, go to Alaska and are successful there. Um, do. Thank you, Admiral Noel, the uh, JL reported to Congress that the Navy surface fleet is undermanned by some 15% uh, below the required staffing for safe operations. And on the heels of the tragedy of losing 17 sailors on the McCain and Fitzgerald uh, due to the collisions, um, being understaffed is, is really unacceptable. So what are you doing to deal with that problem, and if you need more resources and tools, will you please tell us what you need? Um, Madam Chairwoman, thank you for that, and, uh, and that was a tragedy that we lost those 17 sailors. That was in 2017, as you mentioned, and so um, to give you some of the, the data, since 2017, um, we've added more than 23.8 thousand billets uh, so that we'll have more sailors at sea. Um, we have increased our accessions in 2018, 2019, 2020 from in the low 30s, if you went back to 2016, 2017, to uh, 39,000 in each of those years. Those sailors are starting to arrive in those, in those billets at sea now. And indeed, we've got 10,000 more sailors at sea now than we had in 2017. Well, are you still 15% below the Manning? We'll, we'll look at the GAO report with you, but we have 145,000 um, sea duty billets. Uh, and right now, um, the report that I got as of the end of last week was about uh, five to 6,000 gaps at sea. Um, so as you look at the billets um, that we have uh, bought at sea, um, that's where that Manning is. I, I will share with you, ma'am, so I, I'm not saying that, that we're happy with that number. We're doing a number of things uh, to get after that. Um, you know, when you look at things like our detailing marketplace assignment policy, which is all about how do we provide incentivization, both monetary and non-monetary, to keep those sailors at sea, primarily uh, in the journeyman uh, level. Um, but, uh, but again, we've really been, been leaning into this uh, and we have been helped by very good retention. So right now, um, besides if, uh, again, the CR would be very uh, injurious as we look at stopping PCS moves as well as freezing the accessions pipeline, but, I, but I've got no other ask right now uh, for Congress. All right, um, we'll come back to that. My time's expired, A ranking mem member. Thank you, uh, Lieutenant General Audignan, um I recently listened to a War on the Rocks interview between Ryan Evans and Commandant Berger. I thought it was a great discussion, um, and I, I really think the Marine Corps deserves credit for trying to grapple honestly with some challenges. And among them, the Commandant talks a little bit about lateral entry. And some of the criticism has been that if you're, if you're bringing someone in as an 05 because they have specialized cyber skills, for example, you know, how are you, how are you being mindful of the organization's culture while doing that, you know, you don't allow people to skip certain rites of passage like boot camp or OCS. So talk a little bit about how you think about lateral entry in your 2030 plan and how you respond to that criticism the Commandant mentioned. 
Congressman, uh, thank you for that, that question. Um, what I would say about first about lateral entry is um, thanks to Congress, we already have the authorities that we need to execute this type of program. Inside Talent Management 2030, we are looking and studying how we would implement such a program with those authorities. So the Commandant has been on the record and said that um, this was an idea and a concept to attract that niche that you spoke of, skill sets that we might consider for the Marine Corps. Nowhere in there did we say that we would skip entry-level training, officer's candidate school. I think that's where the misunderstanding of what the commandant spoke to. But there is a recognition that there are programs uh, that services have utilized. The Marine Corps utilizes it for the law program, for example. Uh, an individual will get credit, but the Congress's uh, authorities are to us would be, an example would be, as we study it, could you bring in a man or a woman who has post-baccalaureate degree, service credit would be applied to those degree hours, would go through officer's candidate school and the basic school, and then potentially come out at a different grade, and then proceed to that technical skill MOS. I think that's kind of what we're studying at right now. Um, it is an exciting thing to see where we could go to build capacity in certain areas where we think the future fight will take us in those complex environments. Well, one of the other points he brought up in the interview that I thought was interesting is the idea that today's environment is filled with, I'm just going to quote from him so I don't misconstrue the commandant. As a former captain, I, I don't want to get in trouble. Um, you're, you're, the, today's environment is filled with a different body of people coming into the military with different goals, different priorities, different set of focus. We have to meet them. We have to understand them. Um, could you maybe provide some, some color on that? Uh, you know, and, and what is the Marine Corps doing to, to meet that, that generation where they are? Thank you for that. Um, we've had some in good excitement in this area. Uh, one of the things that's pretty common in the civilian sector is crowdsourcing. Uh, never done before inside a manpower organization, and we tried it. And it was remarkable, the feedback that we got from our young Marines. Uh, as you would suspect, the majority of them want great training. Uh, they want the ability to deploy. They, they're excited about those things. But we learned some other things in here that I think is important as we try to recalibrate Sorry, and balance where we are. Doing a, I'm doing a hearing. Uh, a ha, um, Alan, you got a hot mic. Virtually. You need to mute yourself. I think he did. So, excuse me, sir. So where we would rebalance family and the requirements for the service. Um, we are exercising opt-out authorities. Um, we've just announced it for promotion. We've had opt-out authorities for uh, particular events in your career with no penalty. Um, and then the other one that I think is important that we have looked at is where since 2019 executing what we would call a change of assignment set of orders, which means you would not leave geographically an area, vice leaving an area. And since 2019, we've had 40,000 Marines that are presently at their duty station in excess of 36 months, which is where we want to be, we think that that is an, an avenue to meet and recalibrate. Those types of things are what we're learning from our Marines. Um, but it is kind of neat to see young men and women who have um, that um, swagger that want to serve and ask about great training and want to deploy. And it's really remarkable and it's a pleasure to serve. Well, I'm out of time, and I don't want to be accused of service parochialism, so I hope we might get a chance to ask the other services some questions. But I appreciate that. And I wonder if sometimes we think that retention is about pay, which is a variable that's important. But for younger people in particular, I wonder if it's more about just sort of freedom to, to influence their, their subsequent assignment and a little bit of flexibility as opposed to just the pure economics of staying in. Sorry to go over my time. Uh, to your point, I think we found out that with pilots in the Air Force, Money wasn't doing it. They wanted to be able to fly, and they wanted a quality of life with their families. And um, we have got to be much more holistic. Um, so thank you for those questions. Um, Ms. Escobar, you're recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair, and many thanks to our panelists. Really appreciate your time here. I have the incredible privilege of representing Fort Bliss uh, in my community, El Paso, Texas, and I've had uh, the privilege of speaking to many, many service members, um, and so I, I appreciate uh, the topic and the timeliness of it for me. Um, so. I actually, I'd like to start with what the biggest challenges are that you all see in terms of talent management, including re, uh, retaining and attracting talent. What, if, if each one of you wouldn't mind, please, identifying what the top two challenges are for you that you want to make us aware of. Ma'am, I'm sure similar to my, my fellow service members, we have a very challenging recruiting environment right now, uh, largely due to COVID and some other environmental factors, but very aggressively working through all of that. I'm very proud of where our talent management efforts are going. If there was one we continue to manage and very much focus on stabilization so that we can uh, lengthen our PCS moves and get to the issues that Chairman uh, uh, Spear mentioned as well. But those two remain challenges, one of which we are very focused on and ensuring that the same quality of life, opportunity to excel is applied to our civilians and their families that support their loving soldiers. Thank you, sir. Um, Ma'am, thank you for that question. Um, I would agree with uh, General Brito that uh, as we look at the recruiting landscape, uh, we do worry um, for all of those same reasons. And I would just share that I got a recent report that as we look at the eligible population of youth um, that, uh, that are uh, available for us to go after, um, for service. In the last uh, two to three years, the number that are propensed to serve has gone from 13 percent to 10 percent. So at the same time that we and so many others are going after the same talent pool, and certainly we're competing against each other, uh, we also have the number of, uh, in the pool uh, that is shrinking. That's probably uh, one of my number one concerns. And then the other is, is that as we look um, at, uh, at, at how we keep some of our communities that are always challenging, um, think cyber, think nuclear, um, think uh, naval special warfare or aviation. I think making sure that we have the flexibility and the agility, um, as Rep Gallagher mentioned, with monetary and non-monetary incentives, we know that the centennials are really driven by both, as are folks that are our age, and, and can we change quickly enough uh, to the chairwoman's point, too, to make sure that focusing on warfighting readiness, we give them options and flexibility to keep them in the Navy. So in, the, in some of those uh, specific high demand, low density uh, skill sets. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, ma'am, I won't touch on the recruiting piece of my colleagues have already, but all of us are obviously concerned about that, so I'll go, go in different directions to help our conversation here. First thing I would say is um, balance of uh, individual desires and needs with balance of our, our force. Um, we're working hard to make accommodations and things for, for instance, uh, we have Sikh airmen now, we have uh, Muslim airmen with different hair, hair policies. We have a women's hair policy that we did to help us uh, attract and retain. Uh, we changed rule sets on putting hands in pockets and silly things like that that could help us start to get to that generation. At the same time, though, we have these requirements around the world that we have to meet, right? So um, not all of our locations are garden spots. Uh, not all of our locations allow you to take a family. So how do you do that and how do you balance it? Right now, we have a tour length of about 51 months on station. That's over four years on station here in the CONUS for our enlisted members, uh, 39 months for our officers. Uh, when you go overseas, about 47 months enlisted, uh, 35 for officers. So balancing that out and being able to do that and give that stability is one of the challenges that we have and that we work hard, hard to sort of balance those things together. General, can I, can, I, can I interrupt very yep, briefly because sure. I've only got about 30 more seconds. Something I do want to throw out for you all, just as you're, you're talking about these other policies, I have a wounded warrior fellow in my district office, a Marine. She would love to re-enlist, but she can't because of the tattoo policy. There are things that we really need to look at, and as you mentioned, you know, may sound silly to some folks out there, but what are the obstacles that are keeping out really talented, amazing um, service members, patriots, who want to be a part of the armed services? 
Chair Chairwoman, if you would give me that young lady's name, we'll take care of that. The, the commandant recently <laughs> waived tattoo policy, so there should be no um, issue with the tattoos. Yeah, I was under the impression that the tattoo policy is that's, history. Is that, that true for correct. all of the services? That's correct. And it, there's no restriction at all? It can be up to the neck and up to the that, arm? That's correct. I, I, it's my understanding that if it goes on to the hand, there's a... So there, there is um, some uniqueness to, to the policies, I think, from each of the services the Marine Corps says. It can't go past the collarbone here, and it can't go past the wrist bone. But cl clearly, um, let, let me see that young lady, and we can see what we have there. I, I would offer just very briefly, um, on a, I, I worry about accessions. I worry about the headwinds. Um, we have asked, um, and we partnered with the department um, proposed for a legislative proposal that allows us to get into the digital market, much like the private sector for recruiting, to make sure that we have access to the best uh, and the brightest uh, young men and women that, that cho choose the propensity for service. So I would ask for the support for that proposition. I think the other one I would say just very briefly, the challenges that I think that I see in my service is um, the modernization of our systems. Um, we really are um, in, not in the 21st century, and it is a challenge. Um, I see the vision. It's going to require time. It's going to require money. But if you remember the movie Ender's Game, that's how I see it. Uh, Cloud-based systems, um, applications that run on one system that allow us to have full ready access, human interaction and involvement to help manage those opportunities. That's my challenge. I think that's my concern um, that, that we can't get it fast enough. Thank you. I'm way over time. You are. Sure. Your time has expired. And I know that um, Representative Jackson was putting on his jacket. I don't know if he's still within earshot, but he is recognized if he is. Okay. Um, Ms. McCain. Ms. Bice. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. I, I appreciate the opportunity to, um, to speak to the witnesses today. Thank you for being on. Um, I, I actually want to shift the conversation just slightly to talk a little bit about um, what we're doing to recruit and retain uh, technology talent. You know, one of the things that I keep hearing from the services is what we're doing on the cyber front. And so I want to maybe ask, um, what are you doing to sort of build up a pipeline for um, those critical cyber positions that uh, are currently maybe open or, or unfilled? How are we addressing that? Because it's such an important piece. You know, I think warfare is changing. And one of the uh, important aspects of that is making sure that cyber warfare, it, should it become a thing, um, it is being addressed properly. So can anybody speak to that? Yeah, ma'am, this is Lieutenant General Kelly from the Air Force. I'll start in. I'll, I'll tell you that on uh, the accession front for cyber, we have for the last two years and will continue this coming year over assessed purposely in the cyber side, uh, trying to make up for the talent pieces that we know we need. So we're about at 110 to 120 percent of the normal accession requirement. When we get them on board, though, the, the key that now is giving them something exciting to do and making sure that we are doing things that are going to keep them. Uh, so it's the quality of the service that they get and, and including uh, stability for them. So specifically in our cyber STEM uh, career fields, we have lengthened the tour lengths for initial, uh, once they graduate tech school, uh, they used to go for three years, they're going to four years now. When they get a second assignment, the second assignment is at four years uh, for those folks. But I'll tell you where the challenge is for us is not right now in those uh, young folks, it's the mid-career folks. When we started to grow the cyber ranks out, we already didn't have enough field grade officers and enough folks at the you know, 03 to 05 level. And so lateral entry and trying to catch up a little bit, and that is key for us. I would say we're a little bit behind in that in the Air Force, but those are the kind of things we're trying to do to get the cyber and pieces forward. And ma'am, John Nell from the Navy here, if I can just jump in there um, to kind of continue uh, what General Kelly was talking about. So I, I think um, one issue is uh, is how do we find them? And I think we're all going down that path. Um, but then the other is as we, as we bring them in, and then to your point on the retention. So we've done a couple uh, things here. For instance, um, for our cyber warrants, we brought back the Warrant Officer One program for the first time since Vietnam. Uh, and we specifically targeted our cryptologic techs uh, who are called um, interactive on net. So they're the folks that go in there and actually do things in dark rooms. At the E5 level, we heard 
that they didn't want to become a chief and then kind of lead a division, do the administrative stuff. They wanted to actually go ahead and sit in that dark room and launch tax. That's what we do with warrant officers. So we created it. Um, we brought in our first tranche here uh, two years ago, and we get about an extra five to six years in the warrant ranks with these sailors, and we found that that's very, very uh, popular. Uh, we, we've also um, uh, leveraged the DOTMA authorities with lateral entry, and so we have been able to bring in 44 officers uh, here over the last two years uh, in cryptologic warfare and our information professionals that will work uh, in this realm. So I think we've got to we've got to approach it from a number of different fronts. Admiral, I think that's a great point. You have individuals that are um, experts in the cyberspace, and they're not necessarily wanting to be in a leadership role. They know what they know, and they're really good at it, and they want to continue to be in that role. And so finding ways to develop them, to, to give them additional responsibilities without putting them in a leadership role is incredibly important. And Lieutenant General Kelly, you actually kind of segued into my next um, question, which was, uh, I see that you know, you are looking to potentially PCS those individuals at a longer time frame. Is anyone else looking at that? Because I do wonder just sort of generically, not specific to cyber, but do you feel that the uh, two year rotation for families is becoming real, a real burden? And is there a, a thought process or a discussion happening around lengthening that PCS time? Congressman, this is Lieutenant General Brittle from the US Army. In short, yes, for sure. The stabilization is key. And again, we do look at professional military education, professional growth, but also take into factor school stabilization, high school stabilization, which may be key for some families, spousal employment as well, to include some incentive programs that will help a spouse if he or she should be PCSing within the continental United States or overseas. Specifically to, to cyber, as one of my peers mentioned, giving them the job that they want to do to help retain that talent while in in some cases, incentive bonuses as well, tied to a stabilization of up to six years in some cases that will give them one job, satisfa job satisfaction and help us compete with a very demanding envi uh, uh, civilian environment for that talent skill. Yeah, and I think that's one thing that we need to look at um, sort of a, an overarching discussion is we're training these individuals, they're working in an incredible environment, but let's be honest, they're probably not making the pay that they could make in the private sector um, but they're incredibly necessary and important to uh, mission readiness and, and national security. So looking at long-term, how do we keep those folks engaged um, within the services is gonna be incredibly important. Uh, Madam Chair, I appreciate the opportunity and I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. Uh, the gentlelady from Washington, Ms. Strickland, is recognized for five minutes. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Vesey, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to ask specifically about service academies um, in the district that I represent. And this, and I talk with other members that also represent urban areas, and they have a very tough time getting young people to apply uh, to the service academies. Is there anything that you're doing specifically to target talent at uh, and you're more urban areas in the in the you know if in the if you look at the Dallas Fort area we represent a very large metropolitan area so we have a lot of members of Congress uh, uh, in our uh, very specific geographic region and the outer suburbs the exurbs they don't have any problems recruiting but uh, those of us that represent the more urban areas do is there anything that you're doing to specifically uh, reach out to some of these kids to make sure that they know about the opportunities that are available in your various services. Yeah, Congressman, I'll start. I, I know you guys have had the uh, opportunity to talk with Lieutenant General Clark at our United States Air Force Academy, um, who is uh, all over this topic and more, right? And so one of the things that he's done is identify those districts and places where we found talent, where we have lacks of nominations. So he's engaged congressional members in talking about uh, the nomination process. Uh, we've got a recruiting pool, applicant pool goal uh, for which we set diversity goals uh, for the applicant pools to come in. And I'll tell you that it's over the last couple of years has started to manifest with this last graduating class was our most diverse class we've had at the Air Force Academy. Uh, the number of folks going into operational career fields, particularly pilot training, 
uh, from a, a gender and racial uh, um, diversity perspective is the highest we've had. So they're, they're actively going out, looking at those districts that you're talking about. They're engaging congressional members on, you know, please nominate some of these folks to come in because we've had uh, congressional districts who haven't nominated in the past. And I know uh, it's starting to manifest itself. And in, in, like I said, the last class we had at the United States Air Force Academy has made great strides. I think we were 46% uh, non-white male, if you will, in terms of the diversity coming out of the Air Force Academy. And, and let me ask uh, this also, uh, and Admiral, I'll, I'll let you weigh in here in just a second. Um, you know, when I was, and I, I remember this vividly, even though it's been 30 years since I've been in high school, literally can remember it vividly. The NCOs, and they were, it was usually when they were on their way out, they would go to a specific high school and set up a table, usually in the lunchroom, uh, and they would talk to kids about enlisting. Have y'all looked at going into specific schools? Because one of the things that I worry about is like when you do like a region-wide academy day and you do it on a Saturday and it's in, in a, a location for all the schools to go through that you're really not honing in on, on kids at specific schools that are missing out on opportunities. Are you going to specific schools? Um, sir, I'll just jump in there because we're doing exactly that. And, and we're going there uh, with junior officers who look like them. We call it JODO, uh, Junior Officer Diversity Outreach. We're looking for all kinds of talent there. But, but when you have a young surface warfare officer or an aviator or a submariner um, where those students can relate, um, that, really, uh, that really resonates. And then that helps us find the folks that we then want to try and bring in for those summer STEM camps, for a uh, summer seminar. Um, and then, and then we're doing this very similar on the NROTC side. Good, good. If if we wanted to, as individual members, reach out to respective branches about uh, uh, targeting high schools in our districts, well, how what, how would we re, uh, reach out to you? And I, probably for all of us, if you have someone in in your office, uh, contact us. We will take you up on that in a heartbeat. Okay, good. Yes, sir. Good. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, General uh, Audegon, am I pronouncing it correctly? Yes, yes. I, I wanted to specifically ask you about diversity. I, there were a, a series of articles last year, a year before last, uh, about the fact that the Marines still has, have not had a, a black four-star general. I think that y'all were the last to have a, um, uh, a, sarge, a black sergeant major of, the, of your branch. Uh, to be the the head person, or is the Marines looking into diversity uh, in their ranks and and how they kind of alleviate some of that? Because that is, you know, I mean, you know, we're we're seeing everything happening right now with with NFL, for instance. Have y'all looked at just some of the structural uh, uh, components within your branch to just to try to address some of that? Because we obviously want kids that are trying to go into cyber and trying to go into some of these fields to know that, hey, if I go and join a, a particular branch, I'm going to have all the opportunities that everyone else has. But if they read that, hey, it's 2022 and everybody else has had multiple four stars, but this branch has not had any four stars and they were the last to have a star sergeant major of their branch. Like, how do you work through all of that? What are y'all doing to, to, to try and address that issue? Congressman, uh, th th thank you for that question. Um, First of all, let me say uh, this. Um, we've got a ways to go, but we've made some great progress. And we've been at it for several years. And the statistics that I have um, sometimes fall flat because um, we're not stopping there or we're not trying to pat ourselves on the back. Um, but you refer to officers, and I think that's important because we recognize that. In the last five years, the Marine Corps in its officer sessions has been 35% diverse, and it's been that way for the last five years. Also, I think more telling for me, as I look at the playing field, in our one-star ranks, 24% of our Brigadier Generals have diversity. The, that's compared to the overall population of 14%. That tells me that the um, work that we're doing is the long game, and it has been the long game, and it has been how um, do we reach um, people of all diversity, of all colors, because we think that it's a part of the fight that we represent, we are going to fight next. So to me, um, 
we've been focusing on this for several years because we recognize all the way back through to General Neller, to General Amos for that matter, um, that this was going to be necessary. So we have work to do um, on particularly the officer's side of the house uh, to get to where we have a sufficient pool of senior officers where through a competitive process, fully most qualified will make the executive ranks the general officer ranks. But I think it's important that we recognize we, we have had um, an African-American Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. 43% um, of the Marine Corps is considered diverse, of diversity. So there are a lot of good things happening here in the Marine Corps. Close to 10% uh, identifies women for gender. Um, officers' uh, accessions uh, for females is at 13%. So there's a lot of things happening here. Um, but I acknowledge that we have work to do in that space. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. 10% um, is not very good when the rest of the military is at 18% or 20. Um, we now will um, cede the floor to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Jackson, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Spear and Ranking Member Gallagher for holding the hearing today. I also want to thank our witnesses for being here. I appreciate your time. Uh, understanding issues related to recruitment and retention is important as decisions are made in Congress regard, regarding funding levels, of course. Uh, now more than ever, we need to focus on maintaining a military that is prepared to fight and win in a conflict against a highly advanced adversary, adversary such as China. The 2018 National Defense Strategy laid out a strategic approach to addressing military challenges. We need to focus on building a more lethal force, strengthening our alliances, and reforming the Department of Defense practices to match our modernization efforts. When thinking through those lines of efforts, the number one priority is taking care of our greatest asset, our people. With that said, I have a question. My first question is, we're currently in the middle of sweeping uh, reform in the military health system. This includes transferring responsibilities that used to fall under each service to the Defense Health Agency. Over the past year, I have prioritized going to some of our major medical facilities around the country to hear directly from our medical personnel. Regardless of branch or rank, one common theme that I keep hearing is that nobody has a clear explanation to, for me, to me on how these reforms are, are going and, and what it's meant for, the, for their future and for the future of military medicine. I think that that could potentially be a problem. I think it's starting to be a little bit of a problem with morale, uh, and I just wanted to address that. Uh, if we lose uh, m medical personnel and jeopardize our medical readiness, we will not be able to recover quickly. That's not something we're going to be able to stand up very quickly. And we could face se severe casualties in a future conflict. Those casualties could be avoided if we focus on retaining these service members and maintaining adequate medical readiness. Uh, General Brito, could you speak specifically to the Army's efforts to retain medical personnel as we undergo comprehensive reform within the military health system, and what policy changes you will need from us to ensure that we retain these highly skilled members and don't lose them to the civilian sector? Uh, thank you, Representative Jackson. Under the umbrella of leadership development, we must continue to, one, recruit the best, retain the best, and give them the best leadership and medical training so they can provide the best services to our soldiers and our families. That is including a very aggressive retention effort as well, largely led under the umbrella of our Surgeon General and other medical professionals, fully respecting the complexities that may come as, as services get rolled into the DHA. Uh, for one, job satisfaction, a continued a medical training which they, need to, which, which, which they need, and continued training to keep them advanced in the skills that they need to provide uh, with every, whatever specialty they're working in. Also, we, we are leveraging the authorities that have been provided to us uh, through direct hiring authorities and direct commissioning. We do have some specialized talent that wants to serve in the Army and can serve in the Army to bring them, bring them in and continue to provide the service that we need to, this, to our soldiers, both in garrison and, as you mentioned, more important, as important, while deployed as well. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And I'll just let all of you know that I'm, I'm, I'm I'm invested in making sure that this goes well. I know it's a, it's a work in progress right now, but as, the, uh, as a former military member, 25 years on active duty and in the medical corps, uh, I, 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 and on this subcommittee, I wanna make sure that I'm an active part of making sure that we're doing everything we can to make this successful, because I know it's an important transition for our folks. Thank you, Congressman. Yes, sir. Um, I have one more question. Having spent 25 years on active duty as a Navy emergency medicine physician, I still have close relationships with many on active duty. I have some concerns about some current plans that I've recently heard about. I hope to find out what's driving these plans so that I, so that I and my Haas colleagues can hopefully address any problems in next year's NDAA. I believe and I know that each of you will agree with me that our medical readiness should not be an afterthought. Vice Admiral Now, 
I would like to ask you to respond to this question first. I don't think we'll have time for the other services to respond, so I'd like to just ask if you could get me the information from your services to my office in the next few weeks. I'd appreciate that. But um, the Navy provided information to my office, sir, that uh, right now currently uh, about 6.5% of the officer in strength in the Navy is made up of the medical corps, uh, yet only 4.5% of the Navy's authorized flag billets are medical personnel. There's probably around 10% of the military, of the Navy that's made, uh, the uh, officer in strength uh, that's made up of medical personnel in general. And uh, well, I think it's the 4.5% is, is how much uh, of the overall Navy uh, medical side, not just the medical corps, uh, includes the flag billets, but 1.9% from the medical corps. My point is that these, these numbers are a little bit off. It seems to me that there's a discrepancy here. This discrepancy concerns me because I don't think it's an adequate representation of senior leaders in the Navy advocating for the needs of military personnel and for the care that our active duty uh, uh, operational troops are, are gonna be provided by these folks. Um, my question, sir, is that, uh, uh, do you know why this plan is in place? Can you, can you tell me a little bit about how this is, uh, this is playing out and what we can do to, uh, uh, to, re to remedy that, because I'm interested in making that happen if I can. Um, sir, thanks very much. And having benefited, benefited from military health care for 38 years and with a son who's a lieutenant who will start Uniform Services Health College next year to become a Navy doctor, uh, I'm pretty passionate about that. And I will um, first say that, you know, we are really looking at distributed maritime ops as we look at what we're doing now um, with different uh, units of scale. If you think a carrier strike group, but sometimes a surface action group, we've spent a lot of time looking at what do we need to deliver that expeditionary health care. With respect to the number of uh, flag officers, I would tell you um, that, that the Navy uh, believes that we probably need Congress to mandate more. Um, you know, we've had a drawdown for all of the service and flag and general officers. We do understand why. Um, but that's forced us to make very hard decisions to include the flag officers uh, that are delivering uh, health care. So we'll work with you on that, um, but we certainly share your passion. But I, but I do think when you look at some of those numbers, what explains some of that is actually congressional mandates on ceilings for flags and general officers. Gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the gentlewoman from Washington, Ms. Strickland, is recognized for five minutes. And uh, before you... Um, ask your questions. If you'd provide all that information to the committee as well, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Service members and their families make sacrifices every day, and we must do everything to ensure that their experience while they're serving is a good one. It's why I led a letter to the Defense Approach Committee urging Congress to raise base pay for service members. Today, however, I want to draw your attention to research released by Blue Star Families and Institute for Veterans and Military Families on experiences of military and veteran families of color. Their data was compelling, and it really points to key challenges to recruiting and retaining a diverse, ready force. So I'd like to submit the Blue Star Families Social Impact Research 2021 into the record, please. All right, by 2027, most recruitable U.S. adults will be people of color. And we know that a person's familiarity with the military, not necessarily race or socioeconomic status, is often the best predictor of joining the armed forces. However, it is also likely that experiencing racial and ethnic discrimination while in uniform will decrease one's likelihood of recommending service to a young person. So to all the witnesses, very briefly, can you please talk about how you're ensuring that your respective services are an attractive place to serve, especially for communities of color, both to recruit people and to retain them? And I'll open up the floor to anyone who'd like to answer the question. Why don't we ask Ms. McKay to go first? Yes, thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you, uh, um, uh, Representative, for that question. Um, so um, uh, I'd like to first address it on the recruiting side. So um, we have, uh, relatively speaking, smaller numbers uh, into the Space Force, and we are still benefiting from um, the great excitement about our new service. And so we have many, many more applicants uh, than we actually are able to take in. We are very focused, though, um, to the point that's been raised uh, several times here about diversity 
University. And so we've been able to work with our um, Air Force Recruiting Services to actually expand the pool and to do it because we are a smaller service on a quarterly basis. And we're finding that that's allowing more diverse talent to be able to be coming in and to be considered. We also know it's important that when folks are making selections that they do that um, uh, be, uh, and, and look like um, uh, from our uh, diverse background. So um, we're using um, uh, our chiefs, our E9s, and we're making sure that we have um, a diversity on those panels um, as we're making selections. We're also now in um, select university and colleges that are HBCUs, that are HSUs, and that, are, and that have uh, alignments with women colleges um, to be able to get out um, uh, our message and our information um, about the Space Force and, and how to join. And that's both on a military and a civilian uh, from, uh, perspective. Um, and what we bring to these uh, select universities and colleges is uh, not just the linkage with the ROTC program there, but also the linkage with uh, research dollars that we bring. And again, that goes to the question earlier about what are some of the different things you're doing to attract the STEM talent. And, uh, and we find over and over again that there's that connection to be made about um, okay, I'm not sure if I want to do military service, but I could do civilian service, so we're being successful there. Um, and then uh, also uh, to be able to reach out through these institutions that are historically black colleges or uh, Hispanic universities to, uh, to do better in reaching out both from an enlisted perspective and an officer perspective. Great, thank you. Would any other witnesses like to answer this? Chairwoman, I, I just would, uh, this is uh, Lieutenant General Ottingham uh, from the Marine Corps. Uh, very quickly, I'm familiar with uh, the Blue Star family's report and the interaction, and I was grateful that uh, we were able to participate with that organization. Um, our Chief Diversity Officer, uh, General Williams, was involved in that, and it was a, it was a good, uh, good give and take. And I also was um, very uh, pleased to see there were quite a bit of positive um, things that came out of that report that were very good reflections. I think for us, with the recommendations that came out of that, we really want to focus on uh, military personnel readiness that's related to the families, as you described, about making sure that we um, find that recalibration and that balance, as well as um, supporting uh, infrastructure within our installations and our communities to make sure that those um, Marines and their families have the best connection to those resources and inside those communities. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And before I run out of time, you know, just emphasizing that, you know, we all want a nation that is safe, that is just and secure, and that should also apply to the folks who serve in our military and their families. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. General gentlemen's time has expired. Ms. McLean, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, I want to thank you all for being here today with the growing threats around the world. It is paramount that we maintain significant force strength for years to come. General Bree, uh, Brito, in, in your statement, you mentioned your command assessment program. While I appreciate the su success the pro program has had or has been, has been having in selecting capable leaders of the future, you mentioned that it is um, too early to draw definite conclusions from, from that program. But can you briefly describe the early um, iterations of these assessments, what you have learned from them, um, how you plan to evolve the program in order to have greater success in finding command candidates for the, for the future? I mean, I think this is a very important point, um, and I'm excited to hear how things are going. Uh, yes, Congressman, thank you very much. And since its inception, we've had 34, over 3,400 eligible candidates participate. If I may use a last cap, cap 23 for fiscal year 23, which we executed back this last fall, had over 1,600 candidates participate for 733 uh, command level billets. And I would note of that around 87% ready for command rate, roughly 9 to 10% not ready for command mate rate. And I would like to mention the the, the components of the CAP assessment, which will kind of talk to your question, are both a cognitive and non-cognitive assessment, a psychological interview, in our case of Army physical fitness test, peer and subordinate feedback, verbal and written communications assessment, 
and a blind panel interview, which serves as a, a key indicator uh, to, to select the, the best talented leader to take command and stand in front of soldiers, whether it's 5,000 or 15,000. Uh, it is very much a data-rich assessment, and we are uh, uh, collecting data on the trends, and I'll just pick one for illustration. Let's say that we see uh, written communication skills as a weakness or, or even a strength, but in the weakness in this case, we tie it back to the leadership development early in the chain. Uh, I would highlight something we have called Project Athena, where we're developing now captains and majors to become better lieutenant colonels and colonels, sergeants to become better sergeant first classes and master sergeants. And, what was and, that project called again? I'm uh, sorry. Project. Yes, ma'am. Very proud of it. It's called Project Athena by name. And we're starting at the junior leader level in the intent, uh, pardon my illustration, to connect that junior leader development to the type of leader we want to become commanders and command sergeant majors. And in essence... So in your, in your assessment, it, it's, although it's not finalized, it's hitting the benchmarks in which you wanted it to hit, in which it was intended to hit. I, I do assess that it is, ma'am, and with the data over the future years, I think I know we'll have a more data-rich, informed environment to, one, develop the program better and refine it as necessary, but yet develop those junior leaders early on so that we have a much better prepared cohort as commanders and command, senior leaders when they get to the senior rank. And that would feed into our general officer corps as well. Thank you, sir. General, general Agnaton, I, I wanna shift to you real quick. In your statement, you mentioned that you need resources to modernize your personnel systems. What does modern, modernization mean? And, and specifically, what resources are required for you to achieve this? Madam Chairwoman, thank you for the, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Congresswoman, thank you for that question. First, it comes to resources, and resources, I mean uh, no dollars. Um, but in a lot of the things that we're doing now, um, we are capitalizing on partners. So, for example, we have a great partnership with John Hopkins and the Applied Physics Lab. We are using dollars from OSD to help us craft out this model that will give us a predictive tool that helps us determine those attributes for retention. This will be a platform in which we think will be ripe for machine learning and for um, AI technologies. But we literally want to be able to um, round out our systems, our analytical systems, that will allow us to have at speed uh, information, as I described earlier, um, readily available so that all opportunities are seen and the dialogue between the individual is seen. There are other things inside the modeling that I think is the most important that I think the commandant would desire. The ability to simulate and test against structures, against whether or not the entire human resource uh, process can meet those requirements. That's where we're coming up short but it'll come down to resources, both in dollars and in time. Thank you. General Thank you, sir. Woman's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fallon, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, I appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna start with a little bit of nostalgia, but I'll, I'll get there. And um, it may sound like a little bit of glory days, but not only when I was uh, uh, in the, uh, my college days, I was an ROTC cadet, but I was also on a, uh, I was an athlete and on a football team, and, and we happened to win the national championship in my junior season. And what I, why I mention that is being around that kind of excellence, the Lou Holtz and his team is of coaches actively recruited the best and the brightest around the country. They didn't wait for talent to show up at their doorstep. And so if I could, being the Air Force Homer that I am, uh, start with General Kelly. Uh, I think we'd all agree that the, you know, the high tech, digital, unmanned cyber world, et cetera, is the future of warfare. Uh, General, what is the Air Force and the Space Force doing specifically to attract the world's, or in, this, in our case, the nation's best and brightest entities uh, that, that have a knowledge or interest in these cutting edge fields into the space and air force. Yeah, Congressman, thanks for that question. And, and let me start by saying, uh, as a 1988 Notre Dame grad, I was there too, and it was fantastic. So uh, <laughs> thanks for bringing up the nostalgia. Um, 
you know, so I think the, the key for us is um, we want to attract these people by telling them what they can do and showing them what they can do. As we talked about before, money is a little bit of, of what's out there, but what it's really about and what we see it being about is um, the opportunity to work on something really great with really great people and, and, and have this quality of service. So, for instance, in the cyber world, you know, we've got to talk to them and we've got to show them the things that they can do, you know, the things that they can do um, that on the outside would maybe get them locked up, uh, that they can do for us legally and, and be really exciting and do some great things. And we've got to let them do those things. We've got to let them show their talents and, and show, show the things that are out there. We've started a bunch of academies and things for flying and, and exposing people to cyber and other areas um, that we think are really important. As you mentioned, we, you heard the other uh, witnesses mention, propensity to serve has gone down, right? And so we've got to take more effort uh, on our recruiting side to inspire people uh, and get people uh, interested in those areas. In the past, we kind of took that for granted, but we've really had to invigorate ourselves now in this inspirational campaign to make sure people know about the STEM things they can do, know about the cyber opportunities they will have, know about the flying opportunities they will have in ways that we haven't done in the past, and that's the areas that we're really focused on now. Well, thank you, General, and I, I hope that we're making Colonel Woods proud, our former uh, PAS. But... I, I'm sure he would be. <laughs> uh, the. You know, I, I would have to say, too, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the importance of love of country and patriotism, because if you love your country, you tend to want to serve it. And that, that, that helps. That's just more of a, an ethereal 35,000 foot view thing. But uh, specifically, General um, Adignan, how does the role I'm interested with the Marine Corps, because you are so, you know, such a lean force and, um, you know, the few, the proud. How does the role of social media impact your ability to recruit Marines? It's kind of a two-part question, that, that, and do you feel you have the flexibility and authorities you need to be able to reach today's generation? Congressman, th thank you for that question. I think um, what I would start by saying is that um, I agree that when we look to attract a young man or woman who looks to the Marine Corps for service, we're looking for somebody who's smart, tough, has a fighting spirit, courage, and it is challenging and sometimes in today's environment with social media to reach out to those men and women. One of the things that we've asked for, and again, I, I, I make the selfish plug um, for the ledge prop that the Department of Defense has asked for, which is to allow us to have better access in me social media, which would be commensurate to what we would see in private industry. But we know that um, whether it's every generation has its calling uh, and social media is where a majority of young men and women live and, and clearly there are tools that we can use and should use. I would also say finally that that never stops a great Marine recruiter who uses uh, gaming and, and, uh, and, and those kind of devices to attract young men and women and we can find them, but I think there's more to be done in that space because cl clearly that's where uh, a lot of our youth um, are today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I had just one other question that I'm gonna go over though. Uh, so I'll just leave it to you if you want to- uh, Go ahead. Indulge. Oh, thank you. Just for um, General Brito and uh, Noel, the, we, we hear reports of rundown barracks on occasion or you know contaminated water supplies or families not being taken care of. And I just wanted to get a quick thought about, all right, to hear what they would do differently and uh, to make good on our promise that we're gonna treat our military like the, the, the best in the world they are. So we will share the same concern for quality of life for our soldiers and their families, of course. Uh, I can tell you it's, it's, that is a major priority for our, most our, our senior leaders in the military. Uh, listen to the soldiers, listen to the families, and if something needs to be done, take action on it. Uh, but clearly, and it's something that needs to be invested in on with the, with the utmost leadership and financial investment if necessary and when necessary. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. We're going to do um, a second round. Um, and if you could keep your answers um, short and concise, I can maximize how many of my questions I can get in this round. Um, 25% of the spouses are unemployed. Uh, that is a huge hit for service members, particularly enlisted whose uh, salaries are low. What are each of you doing to try and assist in terms of finding employment for spouses? But I want you to be brief. Ma'am, uh, 
Chairwoman, since you're going to hear from all of us, I'll just hit one of the many initiatives, that, a few initiatives that we're working now is an online tool for our spouses to see opportunities at their set installation or one that they're going to move to and apply for it early on. That's been helpful. And also leveraging uh, home station businesses on the respective installation where a spouse that may have a home-based business can run that on a respective basis as well. And additionally, sharing all this in a very aggressive sponsorship programs and in our processing programs when a, fam a soldier with family shows up at whatever camp or installation, for the installation they're gonna be at. So the Marines are uh, creating an environment where you can do change of duty but not change of station. Is the Army doing that at all? Because that would help with unemployment. We are working in the, within the umbrella of stabilization as best we can, but again, we do take into consideration the, the readiness requirements of the Army and the professional growth of that soldier and do stabilize them for the sake of their family when we can, but all that is factored into the... Well, it's got to become a priority. Um, mm -hmm. The readiness is certainly an issue for the Marines as it is for the Army, so um, I would urge all of you as you look at um, the, the talk that we uh, engage in with the... Um, the family is retained, the family serves, um, that PCS is a huge issue, and we should look at ways of changing that. Because we did it for the last 40 years doesn't mean we have to continue to do that, particularly if you can change their, um, their duty. Um, Admiral Noel. Um, Ma'am, to your last point, um, we, we have concentrated on the geostability uh, in uh, FY08, 19 percent, same geographic locality, uh, locality moves, FY21, almost 30 percent. So we've seen um, more ability to keep folks in the same place. On PCS spouse employment, first, thank you to Congress for increasing um, the, uh, the stipend for the licensure to $1,000. Uh, we've had 559 spouses uh, that have taken advantage of that. Getting the word out, as General Brito mentioned, where we're leveraging things like our My Navy Family app to get them to military one source and then uh, counselors at our fleet and family uh, centers that can then connect them with both local businesses and, and other online opportunities, pretty essential. All right, General Kelly. Yeah, Madam Chair, one, two, two quick things. Uh, one, we do permanent change of assignment, which is what uh, uh, General Agnon was talking about. That's where you change your assignment but don't change your location. About 20% of our moves are already are PCA. We've had that for a number of years, and we continue to emphasize that. We learned something out of COVID, though, that I want to share, which is uh, we started programs, uh, obviously forced to for telework, but we started a program called remote work, and we formalized a policy where we now have, particularly for staff assignments, not every assignment lends itself to it, but for staff assignments, uh, folks who, who get a staff assignment but never leave their current location. I have a person on my staff who lives in Louisiana, one who lives in Texas, who are now assigned to the A1 here in the Pentagon who never PCS'd. Uh, they remote work from down there. Uh, they do their things every once in a while. They come TDY to the Pentagon, but they didn't never move. We saved PCS dollars, and they live in the same Great. location where they were. Thank you. Madam Chairman, the only one I would add uh, to my, from my colleagues, and I, I do agree, the licensure um, fees were, were very popular. The other one I think that I know you are very passionate about it is child care. I think that's something else that is um, something we want to pay attention to. And as I've mentioned before, we've seen some great success with our off-base fee assistance and uh, where we take um, what the rate would be for the installation and capped at $1,500 that if they cannot get onto the base, that there's an ability to provide childcare off base. So I think those are some important things that I know we, we wanna work very hard at because I think that also lends itself to employment from our spouses. Thank you, Ms. Mulcahy. And Chairwoman, um, I wanna thank you for that question too. Um, we have been really focusing at both our junior and our senior folks with um, that come up for assignment to make sure those that are part of a military couple, especially now that many of them are with the Air Force or with other services, to be taking that really deliberately into uh, account. And then I too wanna to echo General Kelly and say that we have multiple instances now in this past year of where we've been able to do these remote assignments for staff assignments for NCOs and for officers, and it's been very successful. All right, uh, final question, parental leave. We have authorized 12 weeks. Uh, I wanna know, are you each going to institute 12 weeks for the service member? I'll go first, Chairwoman, we will. Whether they're, the, whether they're giving birth or the- Foster care or adoption, okay. yes, Chairwoman. Madam Chairwoman, one of the things I wanted to let you know was that um, 
we will this week release the uh, three-week secondary care leave that we discussed. Excellent. Good. Um, and we are going to work very closely with the department um, to implement the NDA language for the law. And as you know, um, the commandant has spoken um, pretty clearly, both in written and in uh, the press, about his commitment to families and to that particular issue. General Kelly. Chairwoman, easy answer, yes. We're going to implement in the full state of the law. We're ready. The policy is ready to go as soon as uh, DOD publishes it. All right. Admiral Noah. Uh, in similar fashion on the uh, three weeks, the Navy uh, is supportive of that as well, and we're working with OSD on the 12 weeks. Well, are you going to increase that? You can do that now to three weeks, and then it's going to be 12 weeks. And then, and then we're working with OSD on the implementation of the NDA language, yes. Okay, very good. Uh, uniform, ma'am, yes on the three, and as the NDA law comes out, execute the 12 as well. Thank you. I, um, my time has expired. Gentlemen from what state are you? Wisconsin. The gentleman from Wisconsin is recognized for five minutes. Alaska, Wisconsin, cold states. Uh, I, from, I come from a family of domers, so it's disgusting to hear all this Notre Dame love going on. Um, Vice Admiral Noah, I, I genuinely appreciate you responding to my letter. Uh, a lot of times we send these letters and we don't get a response. We may have a disagreement on the issue, but my concern at the time uh, in response to your comments that we need to use photos to enforce diversity for general officer, flag officer selection boards was that we we're gonna start explicitly judging people by the color of their skin, and that might sort of paradoxically stoke racial tension as opposed to alleviate it, as well as undermine sort of the concept of a colorblind meritocracy, which my view is essential to the military. Your response was, well, I'll let you respond and characterize your response as opposed to mischaracterizing it myself. Um, sir, thanks for that. Um, and those comments at Sea Air Space, um, and, uh, and, and I, I think what I would uh, zero in on is that when we talk about diversity, we always talk about not only diversity of race, gender, and ethnicity, but of thought of where you're from, Wisconsin, for instance, uh, or uh, how you attack problems, and we value all of that. So for us, it's all about war fighting readiness. So, so that's, that's really the point that we want to make, and to your point, um, we don't ever want um, in the Navy, or I think any of the services, uh, to not give both the reality uh, as well as the appearance of being a meritocracy. So we do think that that is uh, very important. I do, I do appreciate that, because I think sometimes when we hear the CNO or other Navy officials say diversity is our strength, it raises the question, well, what type of diversity are we talking about? Yes, sir. If we're solely talking about racial and gender diversity, to the exclusion of intellectual diversity, then we might have a disagreement on, on this committee. Um, and I, I'm hearing you say we're talking about all sorts of different types, correct? Uh, that, that is true, sir. And, and, and the way that we characterize it is that um, you not only want a diverse team, but you have to lead it inclusively so that everybody is a part of that team and they're buying in. Uh, and so that's part of... Uh, not, not your question, but as we look at what we're calling our culture of excellence, that's all part and parcel of that. So again, about war fighting readiness. And I think is the, is the issue in the Navy, because the Navy concedes it is more diverse than the rest of the population, but the issue is specifically with the flag officer class, which is not as diverse as the rest of the population. And, that, and that's a great point, sir. So I, I will tell you, one, so we, we do know, though, we need to bring more diversity in the front door across all of the areas that you have been talking about. And then we've got to do a better job retaining it. And then as we look at the flag ranks, while we have made progress there, um, we're not where we want to be. Um, in most meetings, I look around the room and it's a lot of folks that look very much like me. Um, so uh, that where the rubber meets the road in the Navy is our 17 communities. Yeah. And so um, the CNO and the vice chief uh, meet biannually, so twice a year, with the three-star that, that leads each of those communities, and they talk about what are you doing across character, across competence, and then connectedness, and they specifically look at how are you developing your leaders, 04, 05, 06, so that we actually have the folks going into those flag boards. So for the, you've made this claim that diverse teams that are led inclusively perform better, and does the Navy have data to support that claim? And I, what type of diversity you're talking about in that context? Uh, so, so I will tell you, a lot of times when you hear that, you, there are Harvard Business Studies um, or uh, from academia that, that will give that to you. And typically, they're talking more from the standpoint of race, gender, and ethnicity. So, but, but so we certainly know, though, that when we look at ships that are knocking out of the ballpark uh, during their uh, deployment workups, 
it's, it's, uh, it's a diverse team across all those areas, and it's led inclusively. Um, we are just now, though, getting after the better data collection to be able to say, here's that outcome, and now we can link that all the way. Back. Again, it's like what type of diversity, though? If it's true that more racially or gender diverse teams on ships perform better, that's an interesting finding. But when you actually look at documents the Navy has produced for evidence, it's not saying that. Specifically, you cite, in the Task Force One Navy report, cites a, an article from 2014 from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which took 180 people with finance experience and gave them brief exposure to diversity, basically taking a white participant to a non-white participant, and then sent them to individual computer terminals to make fake bets on fake stock markets. And that's the citation that the Navy uses to say diverse teams are 58% more likely than non-diverse teams to accurately assess a situation. I think that, I actually think it undermines the case because it's such a poorly designed study that's not applicable to the world of finance, let alone to the specific business of asking young men and women to kill and be killed for their country. The other study you said the Navy cites is this 2015 McKinsey study called Diversity Matters. It omits half the data set and it also has this complicated formula for quantifying sort of the diversity of a board that makes no sense if you dig into it. So I just bring, I run out of time. I know this is a fraught topic. I actually think if we had better social science, we'd better answer this question. In the, the report that was just mentioned that we read into the record, if you look at the methods, I just got this, so I, forgive me. It, it admits it's not a statistically representative sample. So what are we supposed to do with it if we can't, if we can't even understand the problem? I, I don't know how we can devise a solution. So I've gone over my time. I'm sorry, Madam Chairwoman. You can take it from future time. <laughs> The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Jackson, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I don't have any further questions. All right. Can you just officially mention who you're going to present to the All right. Um, Mr. Fallon, you are recognized for another five minutes if you would like. I think he's not listening. All right. Um, so. Um, social media. <laughs> I want to thank you all for um, participating today. Uh, we're very engaged, as you can tell. We want to see um, the services succeed in, in meeting their, um, their goals for uh, both accession and retention. And we want a 21st century military. I mean, it is different. And we've got to... Um, change our ways so that we can retain the talent uh, that we develop. So um, many of these questions um, fall into that category. I would um, like to just close by, by thanking you. Um, and I appreciate the fact that you appear to be um, very flexible in terms of looking at the future. And I really think that's going to be necessary if we're going um, to be successful. So I'm going to um, identify the testimony that I'm going to be um, putting into the record. It's congressional testimony from the American Federation of Government Employees, AFL-CIO. And without objection, that will be um, admitted into the record, and we stand adjourned. <laughs> He's dreaming of Lou Holtz. <laughs> yeah. Gridiron glory. <laughs>